The enigmatic, the mysterious, the perplexing, and yet utterly fascinating Home on the Lady is back in the news. Just recently, South African anthropologist Dr. Lee Berger has been has revealed and discussed some of his most recent findings, uh, along with colleagues ar around the world in his research group, uh, from the cave system, the Rising Star Cave System in South Africa. This is where bones of what he has called Homo naledi were found in 2014 and revealed to the world in, two in 2015. Uh, ever since then, um, anthropologists and people of, uh, of, that have any interest in human origins have been grappling with how to understand the place, the position, the time, uh, uh, and who were the individuals that represent these bones found in this cave. As I said, this is a, an enigmatic, mysterious, captivating um, site. And so any new information that comes out of the site uh, often has a sort of rethinking and going back and asking ourselves, uh, what does this new information mean with respect to how we are to understand um, the history of uh, this particular species or, or what these things are. So I have this, uh, what, what was the most recent finding? Uh, one of the things that uh, Lee Berger revealed is the probable um, evidence that Homo lady had the capacity to use fire, uh, not just, uh, and probably make fire and utilize it as a, as a resource in terms of cooking food. Uh, I have a question mark here. Homo lady made fire, question mark. Uh, and that's because I haven't seen the papers that will discuss this evidence of charcoal and horrors and burnt bones. Uh, and most importantly, the dating that's going to be done of those particular uh, sites where the, the burnt remnants are. But their close connection, uh, both physically uh, and probably, of course, temporally with the sediments that the bones of Homo lady are found in makes it a very reasonable inference that Homo lady is responsible for the evidence of fire in this particular cave. And so that's a very uh, interesting new revelation uh, for what Homo lady was capable of and does ask some, does cause us to ask some really interesting questions about Homo lady. Now for myself, I'm interested here in what the response of young earth creationists have been to Homo and the Lady, and I've spoken about this uh, and written about this in 2015 and in 2017, looking at the response of young earth creationists to Homo and the Lady and how they have interpreted the evidence that, that uh, Lee Berger and colleagues have um, revealed. And so what I want to do here is I want to review their responses and then I want to talk about how will they respond to these latest revelations or will they even respond to these latest revelations. So Homo Lady made fire. How will Ken Ham respond? We've got that coming up. So before I begin talking about the Young Earth Creationist response to Homo and the Lady and this most recent discovery, I think I need to um, give you just a, a brief snapshot of what we're talking about with this particular set of fossils. Um, Homo and the Lady is uh, the name given to a large group of fossils initially found all in a single chamber uh, about 400 meters from the entrance uh, of this cave, the, the Rising Star Cave. Uh, it's a very, very difficult location to get to, and uh, it was very mysterious because no bones or items have been found from the entrance to that cave, but then in this cave uh, or this chamber, uh, there was thousands of individual uh, bones or fragments that have been uh, retrieved from there so far, and certainly there are many, many more because excavation uh, continues to this day. Uh, but fascinatingly, in the chamber, of all these bones, they seem to represent a group of individuals, uh, representing anything from children, young adults, to adults. And these adults would have only stood about four feet tall, weighed less than 100 pounds. Uh, brain case uh, is size is about 450 uh, cc's, so uh, just a slightly larger than a chimpanzee's. 
and about one third that of a modern human. Uh, so here you have a weird collection of bones of multiple individuals uh, that all appear to be from the same species. And uh, to uh, Lee Berger and his colleagues appear to represent something that is not any species that had ever been seen before, hence the new name, Homo naledi. Now, the fascinating thing about these bones are that they represent a, a what appear to be a mixture of some bones that have very modern, anat anatomically modern human uh, features to them, uh, and other bones that are more ape-like. And so it's a really odd, very, very odd mix of characters. And so explaining the combination of the foot bones, the hand bones, the various arm bones, of course, the hip is really important, uh, where the neck is attached to the head, uh, the jaw, the brain case, obviously, and the different uh, shape of the brain. Uh, are all things that paleontologists are interested in in terms of trying to define uh, where this particular organism, which lived at some point in history, uh, belongs in terms of its relationships uh, both to us or to uh, other apes. And so uh, this was such huge news that young Earth creationists couldn't really ignore this particular story because everyone wants to know, like, what are they? And for young earth creationists, uh, any new discovery of hominin bones or something that appears human-like, but also potentially ape-like, uh, must be either one or the other, right? They have to be either descendants of apes, created as apes, or they are distinctly created as humans or descendants of Adam and Eve. And so it, for them, it feels necessary to place them in one of those two bins, right? You got to either place them as being apes or they have to be human beings. And there's a temptation to immediately make some kind of call, like because Ken Ham is fond of saying it's very obvious. You can just look at fossils and you can tell of apes and humans and you can tell the difference. Uh, and so here you are, you have thousands of bones to look at, right? including multiple skulls and multiple femurs, multiple digits of, of hands and multiple pelvi, right? And so that should surely be enough characters for you to easily look at those, uh, compare them to an anatomically modern human and an ape and say, this is it. This is what, the, what it is. So I made a prediction back in 2015 because I had been watching this story very, very closely. Um, I'd been watching Lee Berger for a while and I knew that he was uh, on to a new discovery and when it was finally announced what had been found in the papers came out and you could see in the publications, here's all this, all these different fossils and, um, and so forth. That's when I knew young earth creationists are gonna have to have some kind of response. And so I made a prediction before I saw any responses. And here it is. I wrote this on my blog. These new fossils are being labeled a new species of homo. Some young earth creationists will probably simply declare them to be human, not much different than you or me. However, others will probably recognize the obvious ape-like features of the skeletons and lack of any cultural artifacts and declare that these fossils were misnamed and are just some type of ape. I'm going to predict that there, are some, after, there will be some initial disagreement among young earth creationists, but that when Hen, Ken Ham declares that these are just another type of ape, that most will come around to claiming the homo distinction and claim that it's just a case of wishful thinking and they will dismiss the traits of these individuals that are more human than ape. So my prediction was is that it might not be obvious to everybody exactly whether these represented uh, want, apes that wandered down some hole, got lost, and then died in this back chamber, and hit, then we stumbled upon their bones many years later, uh, or that they're, the same thing was true for humans. You know, they got chased into this uh, cave, lost their way, and ended up getting trapped in this back chamber, uh, and there we have them today. And by the way, down there in the uh, left-hand bottom, left-hand corner, right-hand corner is uh, Lee Berger himself holding uh, one of the skulls of Homo the lady, sort of giving you a, an idea of size reference of the one-third size of the of the brain case. All right, so that was my prediction. How did I do? I didn't 
I mean, I fared okay, but in the final analysis, I failed to appreciate that Ken Ham's sway was not as strong as I thought it would be. I was absolutely right that Young Earth Creationist fractured into a variety of different responses. In fact, even more distinct responses than I, I had expected. Uh, what didn't happen was that when Ken Ham made his proclamation of, you know, this is what it is, an ape, that uh, not everyone else bought it. Not all of the young, young Earth creationists bought it, and they still haven't bought that explanation to this day. So let's take a look at those responses by Young Earth Creationist. Now, I know there's a lot of words here, and if you're on a phone or something like that, you're not going to be able to read this, but I will tell you the, the, the salient information here and circle it in just a moment. So we're looking at Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, Creation Ministries International. Those are your three big creationist uh, apologetics ministries. And then I have something called Core Academy of Science, which is really Todd Wood, but I'll also kind of lump in a whole bunch of the things that I call the new creationists to sort of fall under this category. The, the fringes around the, the mainstream uh, young earth creationist world. Uh, this is a chart I made for my blog way back in 2017. And honestly, I've followed Homeland Lady and all the, the recent work that's been done and publications that have come out. But Young Earth Creationists have not really changed any of their responses since 2017. In fact, they've essentially ignored these fossils other than just a few uh, individuals that have continued to include Homeland Lady in their analysis. Uh, but there's not been much of a... a rethink on homo lady for quite a while among among creationists and i'm, I'm wondering now and, and of course i'm you know as the title suggests i'm wondering what ken ham will do about this recent evidence if it makes a big enough splash uh if this is something that he feels like his audience is going to see on the news and are going to have questions about then he'll feel compelled or his organization will feel compelled to sort of put out some kind of response how are they going to interact and react uh, to this latest evidence? Uh, I don't know if this latest stuff is going to be that big of a deal. I think it's really fascinating, but I'm not sure that it will make a big enough splash for Ken Ham to feel like he has to respond to it. Uh, all right, so there's your four sort of types of young earth creationists. Let's see how they responded in 2015 and then all the way up through 2017. So Answers in Genesis uh, came down on, these things are just, just apes. That's all they are. They're just another variation of a great ape. Uh, I have the reference there, but let me read the uh, description, the, the most pertinent uh, evaluation. We seriously doubt the original owners of the uh, Denalality, I can never say that, uh, bones were among the descendants of Adam and Eve. Right? We doubt that they're descendants of Adam and Eve, so they're not human beings, as the preponderance of evidence suggests they were animals, one of the variations that developed among the apes, right? So they're Australopithecines and other things that are, are, are kind of human-like, but maybe walked upright, but they're not human beings. They're just apes. All right, so that was Ken Ham's assessment. Now we have Institute for Creation Research, and they came up with a very uh, I, I was stunned, all right, when, when I saw their response. So Timothy Clary, a geologist, responded in a series of articles uh, on the answers, I'm sorry, the Institute for Creation Research website, and he proclaimed they're imaginary creatures resulting from a mixture of fully human and ape bones. Scientists have either been duped or are making fraudulent claims. Now, so either Lee Berger and his colleagues who went down and collected these were being duped. Maybe somebody put these bones down there to trick them. Uh, or they're making fraudulent claims themselves and have made stuff up and are faking some of the data. Um, so they call them imaginary creatures. They, these claim new species appear to be a mosaic of different species put together based on evolutionary biases, not scientific evidence. The scientists built an imaginary creature from bones that likely come from both humans and non-humans. So what happened here is ICR looked at the pictures of these bones and some of the measurements of the bones, and they recognized that some of these bones were very similar and could fit within, if you took a collection of some of these bones, 
uh, you could uh, sort them in and compare them to other modern human bones, or at least Neanderthals and human, everything that they consider to be human beings, and look at the variation among them and say, these fit within that variation. These, these are represent descendants of Adam and Eve. These bones do. But on the other hand, there was another set of bones, all right, other bones that did not fit those characteristics and were more ape-like. And so if you only just had this bone or this bone, you would like put it clearly put this one in the ape pile, but you'd pick up another bone and go like, this clearly belongs in the human pile, right? I'm looking at these teeth. These are clearly human, but I'm looking at something about the, um, the pelvis. Well, I'm, I'm clearly putting that over here, but then I look at this other bone, uh, some of the fingers, and I'm putting that in the ape pile. And so they're like, well, we have two piles of bones, apes and humans. And uh, for them, if you put them together, that is exactly what they would expect in their definition of transitional fossil, uh, which I don't think is a good definition of transitional fossil. But in their minds, what they always claim that evolutionists need to show in terms of what a transition fossil is, this thing looks like a transition fossil if you put the two groups together and say this is one skeleton. Um, and so I think this is kind of a natural response to this is like, this can't be, this organism can't exist. And so therefore, this is, has to be fake in some way. They've been confused. Maybe they're naive. Maybe there's, maybe there was apes and humans living in this area and their bones got washed down together or they got one got lost and landed there, another one got lost, and then their bones got mixed together. This is a utterly and completely naive view. And it's really inexplicable because if they read any of the original papers, I'm not talking about stuff that's come out later. I mean, I'm talking about what was shown. If they knew how these things were collected, if they had watched the process of it being collected, if they had read the original papers and looked at that original evidence, they would know that many of these bones are, are, are basically laid out so that portions of these bodies, you know, are essentially almost connected together. So you can't say that like these fingers are eight, but the forearm is human being when they're placed right next together, unless you're going to go as far as a vast conspiracy theory where somebody got down there and took these bones and like lined them up uh, next to each other. But the other problem, of course, is, is that this somebody would have had to been incredibly. You know, it just it's it's too wild to think about how somebody could have done this. The eight bones are all the same types of bones from all the individuals found in the cave, and there's multiple individuals that are identified in the cave, and it's always the same bones that are the ape-looking ones, and then there's other bones that are human-looking. There isn't like a human looking finger, right? And then an ape looking finger also in the cave. And there isn't a human looking pelvic bone of this and an ape looking pelvic bone of the, of the same organs of the 20 that are found in the cave. They're all the same. So all the ape bones are always ape bones and all the homing bones are always human bones. If individuals had gotten mixed up together, there should be two of each one of those right, of each one of them. It, it just, it, it's not worth talking about anymore, the, the ICR model, that uh, I, they said this, this is the position they took, this is what they wrote, and they haven't written anything since. I have to believe they understand how foolish this particular response is um, and simply don't feel like they need to correct this and haven't, you know, haven't had to say anything. Well, now there's a chance, right? There's new evidence out there they could write something and like update <laughs> this, this very erroneous view. Creation Ministries International. Um, Peter Line, who has a PhD in neuroscience, um, wrote an article for them in response to Homo Lady, and he said, whoops, he said, probably few, fully human, but with pathological features. So Creation Ministries International looked at this group of bones this evidence from the cave. And they said to themselves, these look mostly human. There's too many human-like characteristics for these organisms to be apes. So these look like descendants of Adam and Eve. However, they also have weird features, all right? Features that 
look apish like and how might we explain that well maybe those are pathological features like all these individuals that are in this cave all had the same genetic disease and that genetic disease caused bone malformations which we then are are interpreting as being ape-like when actually these are human beings all right so can homo naledi be human as discussed earlier most of the features which are said to be primitive in human naledi are still within human variation whether it be modern humans or robust humans for example homo erectus or heidelbergensis or neanderthalensis Right. So saying most of these, many of these characters fall within that. So anything that doesn't quite fall within it, since if they have any human bones, they've got to be human. So therefore they're human, but they have pathological features. Um, and then you've got the Core Academy of Science and Todd Wood uh, and Kurt Wise, who claim that they were fully human. Results continue to support inclusion of early human uh, early homo in the human holobaramin and the newly discovered homo lady can be placed with it with confidence in the human holobaramin. Now there was one researcher, Gene Omix, Genomix, that's a pen name. Uh, it's not that person's real name, he or she, uh, who first concluded that they were fully human, but then you'll see over here, later wrote an article more in depth did in, uh, after another year and uh, decide to reverse his opinion and has decided they're fully ape. So that's, that's the only person that I know of that has changed their mind after the initial assessment. Everyone's just kind of going with their initial assessment. But you can see these are very contrasting viewpoints because one, is, you know, one group is saying these are human beings. They're descendants of Adam and Eve. So we have to explain them as descendants of Noah and somehow after Babel, they migrated to South Africa and then they got lost in this cave and preserved there. Whereas Answers in Genesis is saying they're not descendants of Adam and Eve at all. They're descendants of apes that got off the ark. And after they got off the ark, they meandered down to South Africa, got lost in this cave, and that's how they're preserved down there. So these are very different views. So let's look at, because I'm most interested in Answers in Genesis because we want to talk about what are they going to do? Because they're the ones for which the new evidence is most challenging. Um, and they're the ones that I think are going to have to do a rethink on Homo and the Lady. But they're also often the most stubborn you know, in terms of uh, uh, changing something where they have sort of set it in stone. Uh, so if you go and do a search on their website for Answers in Genesis for Homo and the Lady, you'll get to this sort of landing page. And on this landing page, they have this statement. There are only three ways to make an ape man. All right, because eight man don't exist for young earth creationists. So you have to make them up somehow. How do you make them up? Well, you can make an ape more human-like. You can take something that is an, really an ape and you can try to talk about its human characteristics, humanness, and try to make it more human-like to make your, your uh, transition fossil. Or you can make a human more ape-like. You can take something that really is human being and you can kind of make it seem, you know, uh, you know, emphasize the ape-like characters in it in order to create this transition. Or you can fraudulently mix the two together, right? So that's the, the ICR response here, right? You're, you're fraudulently mixing them. So Homo lady, a new fossil species discovered in South African cave member, is another example of trying to make an ape more human-like. So they have staked their you know, decision on this is an ape. And although it has some features that people claim are human-like, they're really just trying to force the issue and try to make it seem like it's human when really it's just an ape. And then as you dig a little deeper into some of their articles, so here's, here's Gene Omix. Um, and as I said before, that's a pen name. Uh, just say it quickly, Genomics, right? Um, has looked at the likely, and this is the second paper in 2017, in which he concludes, changes his mind from human being to ape by doing this discontinuity analysis, bunch of statistics on, on the bones, but specifically endocranial volume. Oh, actually, in this paper, it's just endocranial stuff. Uh, and looks at endocranial volume and says that, uh, yeah, homo lady is just, a, just an ape. 
And then he responds to a few people that push back, all right? So there are others outside of Answers in Genesis that wrote articles saying, no, you haven't considered these particular pieces of data. But in the end, he says, baromagnetic analysis of one cranial data set and two postcranial data sets suggests that both Homo lady and Homo floria, floresiensis uh, are not part of the human whole varimen, but rather uh, Australopithes. Now, this is interesting because there are also creationists that believe that Homo floresiensis uh, is human, uh, including uh, Ken Ham at times. Um, now, that's one that uh, is also another very confusing fossil. That's the one from uh, Indonesia. Now, that is found. Those uh, Homo floresiensis is a fossil that is found with some stone tools and so forth. And that's the thing that convinces most young earth creationists that, well, if they had technology like that, um, then they're more advanced. And that seems like something that only a descendant of Adam and Eve could have. So typically they place them in the human-like type of thing. But Answers in Genesis here has been saying that Homo lady isn't. And one of their primary arguments is there's no evidence of any kind of culture, right? There's no cultural items. There's no evidence of technology. Um, that they have. There's no art, all right? It's just the bones that have been reported to this time. And I think that plays an overwhelming influence on how they look at these fossils, right? I, I don't think that they're just looking at the bones themselves, doing analysis of bones and making their decision. I think that they look at it as these are just brutes because there is no evidence of any culture and therefore they can only just be apes. And so they just made that decision based on the lack of evidence of any kind of culture. So what, what genomics uh, ha has done in looking at the, uh, the cranial capacity is he's pointing out one of the most obvious things about these fossils, which is they're very, very small brains. Uh, Homo floresiensis, which I just mentioned, most creationists do think is a descendant of Adam and Eve. I don't know if most is the right word. I'll say 50% or more, <laughs> so that's barely most creationist might think that Homo floresiensis uh, is a descendant of Adam and Eve, and so is just a type of human being. And they would say that, again, because of evidence of, well, there's hearths there, so potential use of fire, or use of fire, and there are stone tools, which are in the same layers that, uh, that the fossil, the remnants of Homo floresiensis are found in this particular cave in Indonesia. And so that convinces them that they're descendants of humans, but they have these incredibly small brains. Their brains are only, you know, uh, you know, 400 cc's, or I think it's 426 cc's is the, is the case. So that's, that's about a third of the size of a modern human and just barely larger than a typical chimpanzee. Um, so here they're not really looking at, they're not looking at brain size or they're not considering as much the bones because there again, the bones have mixtures of ape-like features in some of the skeletal features and then some human-like features in the skeleton. So they've really gone with the cultural side of things in order to make their assessment of whether they're human or not. Um, now here, genomics is looking at brain volume, and he's deciding that both Homo floresiensis and Naledi are not human beings, right? They're just some kind of ape, and it's because they have these little tiny brains, uh, and he considers them to not be capable of doing things that uh, modern humans would be able to do. Uh, and he also is here making the comment that there isn't any intermediate fossils that have been found between uh, Floresiensis and Homo lady and all those other uh, hominids uh, that are much larger. All right, so he's trying to find some kind of break point there and saying that they're too different uh, from other modern humans uh, to, to be that case. Yeah, sorry, it looks like I was frozen before. So where does that leave us? Um, that brings us up to the present, all right? So in the present, uh, we discover now I what sounds like it's going to be pretty good evidence that Homo lady was capable of manipulating fire. All right, probably, and that means probably starting fire, moving fire from one place to another, using fire in order to move through this cave system, which only makes sense because this cave is is has lots of extensions to it, and it's hard to imagine individuals being in a cave that far into a cave with no light whatsoever. This would be absolutely pitch black. 
And so it only makes sense that they would have fire to be able to get back to these points. So it's not surprising that uh, after these years now that they're, they're actually starting to reveal evidence that there was fire in the cave. And that includes uh, some small, what appear to be cooking hearths, uh, where there are bones of other animals there. So it looks like they brought in uh, flesh, you know, or animals uh, and cooked them inside of this cave. Right, so that suggests a, a new level of uh, cognitive ability of Homo lady, far beyond what people thought probably something with that small a brain was capable of. And that's one of the remarkable things that uh, Lee Berger has been talking about is just we have these assumptions about like you have to have a really big brain to be able to do certain things, uh, where here we have something with a third of the size of brain uh, and yet has these capacities for being able to learn and uh, use these skills, uh, which are far beyond what a chimpanzee can do. And so what will Ken Ham do? I suspect that fire isn't going to be enough, right? Uh, they're going to say that um, these are still apes, uh, admittedly have some sort of capacity, or, or, or they're going to... The first thing you could do very easily is say, like, I'm not convinced by the data that the fire is uh, was made by Homo lady. After all, were you there? I mean, like, you know, you weren't there to actually see Homo lady walking around making these fires. Maybe there were modern humans in the area and those modern humans came down and like they were the ones that made the fires uh, at, a, at a separate time. And so that's why the dating of the charcoal and connecting that to the dates for Homo lady will be really important. Um, but even so, uh, I think Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, if they want to double down on their position and not try to squeeze Homo lady into the ancestry of, of human beings, um, which admittedly is really difficult to do. I mean, either of these positions are hard to hold. Uh, but if he wanted to do that, uh, if he didn't want to do that, and he wanted to maintain his they're just an ape thing, even if they came out to be the same date, he's not going to believe the dates because the dates are a little over 200,000 years old. And he'll just say that they're both contemporaneous because they're both right around 4,000 years ago. And so these are apes that found their way into this cave uh, after Noah's flood um, and really even during the Ice Age. Um, so there's some, some evidence that of other possible entrances that existed uh, several hundred thousand years ago, which Ken Ham would say was four five four thousand years ago and that there was disturbance within the cave and deposition within the cave uh during one of those ice ages and for creationists the the only ice age that ever happened is the one that happened just several hundred years after the flood and so if that's the time in which these in his case these animals got down into this particular chamber and made these fires or and so forth that would have had to have been right around that particular time just a couple hundred years uh, after uh, Noah's Ark. So they had to have migrated down there, um, done their thing, died, and found themselves placed in this particular cave. Because the other thing about these, the bones is they're not just, they're not completely randomly uh, assorted in, in the cave. Um, so it's, the thing about Homo Lady for me is that uh, I mean, I do find it an incredibly fascinating story because it's just mind melding to think about uh, exactly what the circumstances are that led to the positions where these bones are found. Uh, beyond this chamber, they're also found in other crevices down other in other chambers. And, and supposedly some of the bones are laid really on rock shelves. Uh, these are not natural positions where an organism would die and their bones end up. They wouldn't be washed there, uh, they, so they appear to be placed where they're, where they're at, which is why Lee Berger, right from the very beginning, has had this hypothesis that these chambers are, are basically you know, burial chambers, that they're being intentionally, these, these bodies are being intentionally brought there and then placed in, in, these, in, in these particular places. And that might explain why there aren't any stone tools there, there aren't any other artifacts, it's just simply the bodies have been brought there, uh, likely after they've, after they've already died. And so the hearths and the, the, the evidence of fire is outside of these chambers primarily in terms of the hearths are, uh, from, from, my, 
from my small amount of knowledge that he's revealed so far. And that's why I really need to wait for these papers to come out to be able to delve into like exactly where these locations are in order for us to try to understand the, the circumstances surrounding, you know, when these things happened and why. Uh, but I, my understanding is that the hearths are outside of the chambers where the bones are found. Um, but there is evidence of fire in the chambers, so that would be more like, you know, you're bringing in your fire stick, right, in order to see what you're doing in there, and you're leaving remnants of, of ash, you know, charcoal, or, you know, ash or marks on the, on the ceiling, uh, and then maybe broken bits of charcoal, but not an actual cooking hearth. They're not, like, spending time cooking there. And so all of that does suggest some kind of organized uh, social structure. Uh, and that's the thing that I think should be very challenging to somebody like somebody like Answers in Genesis if they want to continue to maintain this this viewpoint that Homo lady simply is just a descendant of chimpanzees. Because remember, Answers in Genesis believes that, or at least many of them there do, at least that's on their display at their Ark Encounter, or I'm sorry, their Creation Museum. They have a display that shows that chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans and australopithecines uh, and other hominids that they don't consider humans are all just descended from two apes that got off the ark and then diversified into all these things. So Homo lady would have to be another one of these things that another species that had diversified just from two individuals. And they would have done it really quick because they would have had to have gotten to this place to get into this particular chamber potentially before um, or right at the time of the biblical ice age, which is only a few hundred years uh, after Noah's Ark. And so all of these things are, are just, it, the, the circumstances of this particular cave, the location of the bone, the, the numbers of bones, the numbers of different individuals, of different ages, the lack of artifacts, but I've warned Ken Ham and others at Answers in Genesis in the past, the absence of evidence is not something you want to like hang your hat on in terms of an interpretation. I really think that they're hanging their interpretation of this as an ape is not strictly on the evidence of the bones themselves, but on the lack of cultural evidence. And therefore, that is what prompted them to call these apes. And just because they didn't read any reports of stone tools or artwork or anything else being in the cave or maybe clothing or something like that, remnants of clothes, doesn't mean that there isn't any evidence or won't be any evidence found. I've been pretty confident all along that eventually um, they're going to find more evidence of culture for these for this particular species for these individuals and this fire thing is a really good start right uh, towards showing that they have uh, a higher level of social organization and potentially thoughts about you know death and burial which is typically considered a sign of sort of this uh, uh, being um, you know being conscious beings so I think that Answers in Genesis may be able to continue to just sort of maintain their uh, this is just an ape and just call into question some of the data, be skeptical about it and so forth. But in the long run, I think the evidence is going to continue to mount. That's going to make it very difficult for them to cast Homo lady outside of the lineage of Adam and Eve and the descendants of Noah. Now, I, like I said before, I think it's extremely challenging. The location, the timing, the nature of the bones, the, 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 the architecture of the cave, uh, where it is, uh, how far away it is from where, you know, the, the ark would have been, and all those different things I think are all extremely big challenges for young earth creationists. But I do want to say this. I, if anybody with any particular worldview any any view of the history of the world, whether it's an evolutionary viewpoint or a creationist special creation viewpoint, um, if anyone tells me that uh, that they know the answer, all right, you know that that they can tell me exactly what happened there and it's really simple to explain, well then you're not worth really listening to. This truly is a mysterious sight. 
and how homo lady fits into an evolutionary tree is if the evolutionary history of mankind is the real history of mankind has yet to be determined, right? You can do all kinds of speculation, how it fits in there, how they're related to other organisms based on a few characteristics. Um, but it's hard to explain. It just is. It's hard to explain their particular moment in time compared to the types of fossils and other organisms that might have existed at that same time. Um, and so there's so much more here to learn. And it's worth being waiting and finding out what we learn in the future, what we find out in the future before making pronouncements about exactly how either these fit into the evolutionary tree of human history or exactly how they fit into a young earth creationist biblical timeline. You know, they're post flood, but when do they occur in the post flood and what are they related to? How do they come to exist? Are they their own species? Are they their own kind? Uh, and so forth. Those should all be open questions. Those should all be for young earth creationists things that they don't want to commit to. I understand that Ken Ham wants to say like, they have to be either one or the other. They have to either be an ape or they have to be a human being. Actually, I don't even understand that. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think that's necessarily a, um, a dichotomous view. It, it doesn't have to be just two things. He thinks that there's only chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, and australopithecines, and he thinks they're all the same thing. They're all one kind. Uh, who's to say there's not five kinds? And who's to say there's not australopithecines are their own kind, that God made a separate kind of hominid or ape, if you want to call it that. Who's to say he didn't make a separate upright walking ape, but doesn't have the image of God and is not a descendant of Adam and Eve in a young earth creationist viewpoint. And is simply an upright walking ape that may have even had some capacity for like making stone tools. All right. Is that necessarily make something in the image of God being able to make a stone tool? I don't think so. Right. That's not my understanding of being made in the image of God. Um, and so why not home and the lady? Maybe they're a completely separate kind, individually created and made. Uh, and so they're not simply just another ape. I mean, they might be another ape type of kind. Because remember, you know, you could have chimpanzees and gorillas are different kinds, but you could still call them apes in their form of taxonomy. But they're not actually related by common ancestry. So maybe homo lady doesn't have any common ancestors. They are what they are. Maybe there was two home, you know, maybe Ken Ham should put two homo lady on the ark, right? A male and a female homo lady they should have in a cage on the ark. They're just another created kind that was present on the ark, got off, migrated down to South Africa and managed to find their way into this cave. That's where we found their remnants. Um, no, they seem to be stuck on this, like just, you know, we just got to separate them from man and then we're going to put them in this other, in this other pile rather than treating them as uh, maybe unique. But um, so Ken Ham was, you know, I was wrong. I thought that uh, everyone else would kind of bow to the will of Ken Ham. I mean, he is very influential. And since he influences the masses, since he in influences the grassroots, the individuals, the seats in the pews, uh, because he has the most reach, I thought by him calling this an ape, it would kind of make others sort of come around to that viewpoint simply because they don't want to be in disagreement and... Um, they don't want to argue on this particular topic. But uh, to their credit, somebody like CMI, uh, Creation Ministries International, which many of you have heard me say is a little better with the data and uh, more, more willing to go where the data leads them in certain cases. All right. And I think in this case, they looked at it and for them, there was too much humanity here. All right. There's too many human characteristics. Uh, to ignore, and therefore they're placing it in the category of these are descendants of Adam and Eve. And they didn't have to wait around to find these other evidences of culture in order to be able to say that. Uh, and so I, 
I, I think that they're bucking the trend, uh, but they're in, they're going to end up being right. And I don't mean right in the sense of I'm I'm sure that they're right about exactly the the origins of Homo Laity and exactly how they're related to Adam and Eve. But I mean, they're going to be right in the sense of this is what the consensus view of young earth creationists will be in 20 years, you know, maybe even 10 years. Um, this is what everyone's going to be arguing as a young earth creationist. They're going to be they're going to be arguing for the humanity of Homo Laity. Uh, in it is what I think. And just I don't know when Ken Ham will eventually come around to that or whether he ever will. Uh, and maybe those who come after him will be the ones that have to uh, make the changes uh, necessary to somehow convert Homo Lady into from an ape to we were wrong. And it's really a descendant of Adam and Eve. I don't think that'll be that hard because there's going to be some little small bit of cultural um evidence beyond even maybe uh, this this evidence of fire. And then they'll just be like, oh, you know, we were wrong about that and move on. And uh, they won't scrub their literature, but nobody ever goes back and looks at stuff. It's always like what's on the front page uh, at any one time. All right. So those are my meandering thoughts on uh, Homo and the Lady. I find the whole story just really intriguing, fascinating, and I don't have the answers. I just don't. I just don't know how to explain, you know, <laughs> where Homo Lady comes from. You know, how those those little four foot critters, uh, I don't know how they got into that cave. I don't know what they were doing. Uh, I just know that they existed, right? And I, I can't deny their existence. I can't deny the evidence of that, the, that they're in a cave. Uh, and that that cave must have been really dark when they were in there. And so I'm not surprised that they used fire. And so what does the fact that they use fire mean? Um, I'm not really sure. But I love the fact that it's a mystery because it just makes the next piece of data more fun to think about. Um, and so th this world's full of mysteries. And uh, it, it, it's really fascinating to be able to learn about uh, these various fossils, just like Homo floresiensis is, is a really cool uh, fossil as well. And really among those two, they're not talked about much in the creationist literature, right? They love to talk about Homo um, neanderthalensis, you know, Neanderthals, and uh, maybe Homo erectus and uh, some other famous fossils, um, especially famous hoax fossils, right? Um, but there's a ton of other hominid fossils that are relevant to the discussion of what exactly makes a human being a human being. Uh, and for the most part, most of that's kind of ignored in the young earth creationist literature, other than a few individuals like, oh, I, I forgot I was going to mention that uh, um, uh, Paleologos, uh, the, the YouTube channel Paleologos, uh, Peter is, he's already done a video on on this homo lady and this recent evidence and talked about many of the same things I'm talking about here. Um, and he knows these fossils really well. He's going to explain the, some of the actual evidence better than, certainly way better than I am. And he's a young earth creationist and uh, he's fascinated by this site as well. And I think he would say he doesn't fully understand exactly how to explain, you know, the origins of homo lady, what it is exactly, where it comes from. But I think he's definitely more on the side of uh, they must be descendants of Adam and Eve. And he is one that is very willing to talk about this particular location um, because he loves anthropology and he finds these just as curious as I do. And I think God has made us uh, curious human beings and made us curious about ourselves, um, about our history. And um, we love mysteries that we love to learn. Right. That's one of the things that makes us who we are is that, you know, I think therefore I am. I can I can examine myself, can examine my own. My, I have beliefs and I can actually think about my beliefs uh, and I'm not just reacting to the world as a as a robot. Uh, and so homo lady, tiny little diminutive creature carrying a torch um, as just it's hard for me to conjure up the image in my mind. Like, what did that look like? What in the world were they doing? Could they talk to each other? Were they running away from something? Um, what was the deal? 
Why were they there? Uh, I just, I want to know. I want to know. I don't, don't think I'll ever know because that's just the nature of some of these, uh, uh, some of these little, we just have little bits and pieces. Um, and we're, we're tempted to make up stories to sort of fit it into our own, you know, to, to use our imaginations. And that's human nature as well, you know, to use our imaginations to fill in the gaps. Um, the thing about science is, is that you can have your imagination and you can fit the pieces of evidence together and make a story. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what's wrong is if you make a story and then you get new evidence that doesn't fit your story, it, it would be wrong to continue, you know, holding that story in your mind as if that were the truth. Um, you need to you need to allow that evidence to uh, take you somewhere, all right, to guide you toward coming up with a, a better image, all right, a, a better story. Uh, and the more evidence we have, the more we can make our story closer to the actual reality of what happened in history. You know, any historian's gonna tell you that, I mean, there are some things we know really well from history in terms of what happened, almost like running the videotape again and actually seeing those events. Um, but understanding why some of those events occurred, even if you could, even if you know what the events are, knowing the thoughts of individuals and why the interactions occur the way they do and how they, how they eventually influence the future, um, you can see some of that play out, but you can't always understand all of it. And when you're looking farther back in history, you simply have fewer pieces. You obviously don't have the whole videotape. You have just like little tiny snapshots and you're trying to put those snapshots together. It's very much like doing a, you know, thinking about the evolution of species. And uh, you, you only have, you know, some fossils. And you know they're probably connected in some way. And some of the connections we make and we connect together are probably very close to the real history of those organisms. And other ones are, are much more uh, much more educated guesses that might may or may not be wrong, and we're going to show are wrong later when we collect more data and fill in more gaps. Uh, unless you think I'm I'm talking about like deep, deep, deep evolution and the origin of of uh, amphibians from fish or something like that, I'm thinking of just the origin of canines from each other. All right, wolves and foxes and and uh, coyotes and and so forth. Right. You know, we can tie some of those together, um, but they're really only tied together by very, very small little pieces of windows of history, right? We only have a couple of fossils uh, of some of those species. I'm sure for some of the 35 species of canines, we may not really have any fossils. Um, and some we have a lot of fossils of. Uh, and yet we can, we can collect other forms of data like DNA uh, analysis of modern species and then infer from that how their genomes might be related to common ancestors in the past. And here's I mean, the reason I'm coming up with this example. I'm way off topic, I know. Um, yeah, so I'm on a huge tangent, probably losing uh, viewers uh, by the minute. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, if you know, what I'm thinking is, well, the reason I'm bringing up canines is because young earth creationists believe that all canines come from just two dogs that got off the ark, right? Two canines that got off the ark. And so therefore there is a real history, right? For them, there is a real history. There's two individuals. Those two individuals then had offspring that had offspring that migrated, moved places, had more offspring, experienced different environments, diversified, changed their characteristics into the 35 species alive today, plus another hundred extinct species as well. Um, and so there is an actual history of how they're all related to one another. Uh, and so it, for them, it would be perfectly valid to um, imagine how they're all related. Um, and you could do that just by starting by looking at external features and seeing how which ones are most similar to each other. And the ones that are most similar to each other, you might imagine are more closely related to one another and have a more recent history and a more recent common ancestor. Uh, and then you could collect other data, like molecular data. Then you combine that with fossil data and so forth. And you put all that together and you start to have a more fleshed out view of the history of things. Uh, and so your, your, your confidence increases in some of the branches and the actual events that occurred and where they occurred and what time they occurred and so forth. But I would say for canines, 
you know, we still have a very scant knowledge of the history of, of all canines. I, I think we have a pretty good molecular phylogeny, how they're all related. But in terms of the timeline, uh, where they all existed at a particular time, when they diverged into different species, you know, that's, you know, that's where we would, we would say that there's a lot of story, right? A lot of story making in that around the pieces of evidence we have. And so I'm gonna bring that all, bringing that back around to what we have on the screen here. Um, you got Homo erectus. Let's say you're a young creationist and you believe that Homo floresiensis, Homo habilis, Homo lady, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, they're all human beings and they're all descendants of Adam and Eve, which means they're also then all descendants of Noah. So then you have Noah and his family. There is a real history out there, right? Where just 4,500 years ago, all these different morphologies, all these different skulls, um, all existed in the genomes of just a few individuals, you know, on that ark. And so after they get off the ark and start dispersing, those those uh, morphologies have to um, become fixed into different lineages. Uh, and one of those lineages is Homo lady. So why did the, you know why did they get such small brains, right? Why did they, you know, what, what, how was that an accommodation to living in South Africa somehow or living inside of caves or uh, genetic mutations? Or, I mean, see, there's lots and lots of questions you could have. You don't, you don't know any of that history. That's a, that's a blank, it's, it's a story. You have to make up a story for how they went from being Noah to home on the lady with this little tiny brain case, right? and hardly leaving and not leaving any artifacts around and maybe being able to use fire. Um, and so what's fascinating there is to think that, you know, right, you have to tell a story, right? And so um, there's nothing wrong with that story, unless, of course, you have evidence that that story isn't really accurate or true. <laughs> so, um, but young earth creationists do this too. I mean, they believe that all these things are related to each other. So therefore they do have common ancestry. There is an actual real history that leads to all these different branches. But I would say that uh, we don't virtually nothing about exactly how all these branches work. And so that's not all that different than what you see uh, if you have an evolutionary point of view or you say that uh, human beings have uh, a much longer history, and all these are connected somehow. They're just connected to a different ancestor, uh, and that the history of how those branches occur is is rather opaque. And what I've been what I've been trying to say is that Homo, la homo lady is is like one of the most opaque branches. Right? It's it's like just the biggest head scratcher. It's it's like how and how in the world did that exist at the time it existed based on the um, uh, radiometric dating or coexist with other hominid-like things that were very different from them? And so that's where I go back to where I was saying anybody, I mean, everybody, I don't know, there's, there's no one in this world who can tell me that um, based on just the evidence we know, can say like, oh yeah, I mean, this happened and then this happened and this happened. This is this is what they were. This is where they lived. This is what they were doing. This is how they're related to these other species. This is how they're related to Adam and Eve. No, this is how they're related to um, Australopithecines, right? In order to say any of those things, you're going to be connecting some dots that are really, really, really far apart. Uh, and so we need more data, right? More data is the thing that's going to allow us to to make stronger connections um, between these. So don't, but don't get fooled by and to think into thinking that everything is a story. There are many things for which we have really strong, really strong data and strong inferences, and we know the story really well, right? There are portions of the history of organisms that uh, for which there's very strong support uh, for particular branches and particular things that are happening and particular adaptations. Um, but we're filling in that story all the time, right? All the time we're, we're discovering new things about this world and we're learning more about our story and the story of organisms on earth, uh, as we go. 
so that's the that's the journey uh, of discovery. Um, yeah, how did I get off on that tangent? I was talking about yeah, I was talking about canines, and I guess I guess I I can't remember if I made this point or not, but the, the whole canine thing is 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 to say that um, I, I guess maybe it was to say that young earth creationists like to criticize evolutionary biologists for kind of like fantasizing or having stories about how things are related to each other and how they how they might have progressed through history. And what I'm saying is they kind of have the same thing in the sense of they'll say that like this whole family is all related to each other. Here's all these different species, but they just have little tiny snapshots of how they're related as well. And they're just, but they have a conclusion, right? They, they think that they're all related by common ancestor and therefore they piece them all together by taking the very few pieces of data they have and then making a story about how dogs got off the ark and became wolves and coyotes uh, and, um, and domesticated dogs without actually being there, without actually seeing the, yeah, actually seeing it. They, they haven't been able to replay the tape. They can't watch the video. They, they weren't there to actually see those events happen. And in many cases, there is no evidence, right? <laughs> There's abundantly good reason to believe that coyotes and wolves are, have a close ancestor and, you know, share an ancestor. But I don't know, I'm pretty sure we don't have that ancestor. We don't have an actual physical record of that ancestor. We don't have anyone that reported that ancestor. No one's talked about that ancestor. No one, no one reported a, uh, an observation of that ancestor. And yet I don't think it's foolish for a young earth creationist to believe that there is and was an actual organism that was the common ancestor of the wolves that are alive today and the coyotes that are alive today. Just like it isn't foolish for a evolutionary biologist to also come to those same kind of conclusions about other groups and their ancestry. Um, yeah, I had no idea that I was going to go off on this tangent because uh, I was going to make this a yeah a nice short video on just like the responses of young earth creationists to Homo the lady and specifically my projections about what can Hamill do uh, in the future. And so let's just wrap it up with that. I think Ken Ham's going to ignore this story. And I'd be really happy to be wrong. I'd love to see him cover it on like Answers News and like say a few things about like, oh, there's reports about fire in this cave. And if he does respond to it, here's my prediction. My prediction is he's going to poo poo that evidence and he's going to say, you don't know, you weren't there, you don't know if that fire was made by Homo lady or maybe it was made by modern humans. Uh, and so these apes died in the cave and the fire was made by modern humans. And I think he'll he'll just dismiss it very, very quickly that way. Um, I think those who really look at the data and understand the data will not be convinced by that. Um, but those people will not be 99% of his followers uh, will have no idea what the actual evidence is. Simply will take what Ken Ham tells them and like, oh, OK, I don't have to think about that anymore. Uh, I don't have to be challenged by Homo lady because Homo lady and Homo floresiensis are challenging to to anyone's views of whatever they thought history, the history of humanity is. All right, whatever they thought it was 30 years ago, um, these two fossils uh, make you rethink and try to understand in new ways. Um, how humans are related uh, to one another and to their ancestors. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's quit there. Uh, I really look forward to the papers coming out. I'm sure I'll have more to say about this once, and, I'm, and I think Answers in Genesis will wait until the publications. I, I hear that something's supposed to be published before the end of the year. So I will be fascinated to look at that and see what how strong their evidence is for the fire. Uh, fire production and horrors and cooking, and then also how confident they are in the timing of that relative to the time when the fossils were laid down. You know, how, how confident can they be that those two things are happening synchronously? Uh, and, if, and if that looks like very good evidence, then that's something that young earth creationists may have to follow up on. And I think it's going to embolden Creation Ministries International and Todd Wood and others to say we were right 
Uh, and they're not going to say it like that, but they're going to point out that this is further evidence of their viewpoint. I think maybe Institute for Creation Research, if they ever talk about Homo Lady again, I think they'll scrap their, um, hey, this is a mixture of bones. Besides, they found more bones in other chambers. And so the, the vast conspiracy would have to have continued. And there's other different researchers who have come to help with collecting. And so they would have had to have brought all of them into this vast conspiracy. And so it's just, it's just, it's just so ridiculous to think that this is all just uh, faked stuff um, and that scientists are being duped. And, and so I think Institute for Creation Research is just going to have to give up on that. Uh, and then I think they'll probably they'll be able to just slip right over to, well, these are just uh, modern humans and they'll probably go with uh, with some pathological features type thing. Uh, and that's that will kind of cover over their their past. It's answers in Genesis that has the you know, they've got the work to do. They've they're, they're the ones that have to um, figure out like, OK, you know, at what point what piece of evidence is the one that like trips it to like. We have to take this particular piece of evidence seriously because to be consistent with our other views of other hominid fossils, um, you know, for example, Homo floresiensis, um, in order to interpret it this way, we're going to have to we're going to have to uh, ante up and and uh, change our minds on this, um, which is exceedingly hard for answers in Genesis to to change their mind because they're so prone to just making proclamations. After all, it's answers in Genesis and they have answers. Right. That's what they're there for, to provide answers. They're not there to provide speculation. They're not there to provide, uh, you know, this could be this. It could be this. It could be this. Um, but let's wait until we get further data to, to, to figure it out. That's not what their audience wants to hear. Um, and so they do do that once in a while, but it's a rare day. They typically want to just um, this is it. Here's your answer. All right. That's it for me. Um, thanks for hanging with me for a while. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.